All right, this will be Q&A video 14. Now, before I get started, I'm going to do a quick little review of the universal law of levers because it's going to help with understanding a lot of what I'm about to talk about. Now, universal law of levers, you got two variables. you got the lever and directional resistance. Lever is just your bones. Don't get too caught up on the terminology. It's just your bones. Directional resistance is the direction that the resistance would go if you're to let it go. So if you're using a free weight and you're on planet Earth because of what we call gravity, you let go of that weight, what direction does it go? It goes down towards the floor. Now when these two variables are parallel to one another, it's an inactive position. The muscles that attach to that bone don't have to do much work in this position to overcome the resistance. When they're perpendicular to each other, it's an active position. That's when the muscles that act on that bone have to do the most amount of work to overcome the resistance. Now over here, we got some stick figure diagrams, side view of the bottom position of a squat and the bottom position of a deadlift. You're gonna need to understand what's going on there because it's gonna help with understanding what I'm about to talk about. Now Dale G had a question regards to squats. He said, based on all of this, wouldn't you want to avoid going to lockout when squatting? Because when you go to lockout, what's happening is these levers are all going to be parallel to the direction of resistance. Therefore, the muscles don't have to do much work. They're letting them disengage. So if you want to keep the muscles under constant tension, then yeah, you don't want to take the rep all the way to lockout. But depending on why you're doing what you do, it could be to your benefit or it could be to your detriment. So it's not that one way is better than the other. It depends on why you're doing what you do. But I will say this. If you choose to exclusively squat through a partial range of motion because you want to keep the muscles under constant tension, and more importantly, at the position where they have to do the most amount of work to overcome the resistance, then you might also want to include top range partials in your strategy because there's some very distinct benefits that you could be missing out on. Number one, you gotta take into consideration that you're limited in terms of how much weight you can use by how strong you are in your weakest position. Therefore, the muscles producing force to perform the direction of effort are not being subjected to a form of overload for the majority of the range of motion for any exercise that you're doing. So if you're exclusively squatting through a partial range of motion, you're not subjecting the muscles to a form of overload at other relative joint angles. So you include top range partials, you can use more weight because the primary muscle groups involved are closer to their mid-range of position where their capacity to produce force is higher and also because of the biomechanics, the levers are more parallel to the direction of resistance. Now you use more weight, you more effectively overload those muscles but also worth taking into consideration is that by contrast, when you drop down to the amount of weight that you would be using to do mid-range partials, it's gonna feel lighter than it is. You might be able to do more reps or you might be able to do the same amount of reps with slightly more weight, both of which are gonna promote a positive growth response. Also worth noting is that if you train to build muscle, what do you wanna do? You wanna recruit and fatigue as many muscle fibers as possible throughout a muscle's entirety without overworking your capacity recovery. If you exclusively squat through a partial range of motion, just because you want to overload the muscles at the position where they have to do the most amount of work, it's not likely that you're going to recruit and fatigue as many muscle fibers as possible throughout the muscles entirety that are involved in that lift. So top range partials could be to your benefit if you're training to build muscle as well because you'll more thoroughly exhaust the muscles that are involved in the lift. Another thing we're taking into consideration, yes, when you go to lockout, all these levers are going to be parallel to the direction of resistance. The muscles don't have to do much work. But this could be to your benefit because when the muscles have an opportunity to disengage, it facilitates more mechanical work to be performed. The more weight you lift and the more times you lift it, the greater potential growth response. So that's another benefit to actually taking your reps to lockout or just including top range partials into your strategy. So it's not that one way is better than the other. You do what you do based on what you want to accomplish. But if you're going to do something a certain way, understand there might be benefits out there that you might not be getting unless you include something else into your strategy. Now, 0123 normal had a comment in regards to the deadlift. He said on the way up, knee extension takes place. So doesn't the thigh lever, the quad, have to do a lot of work there? Now, I think you're misunderstanding what's going on here. The quad produces force to move what lever? The shin. You want to do an experiment right now? Look down at your quads, flex them as hard as you can. What bone moved? The shin moved. So what's going on here, if we look at the deadlift, the shin is the lever that the quads are pulling on. It is parallel to the direction of resistance for pretty much the entire range of motion. The quads don't have to do much work to overcome the resistance. Now, it's not to say that they're not working when you're deadlifting. Some people say, oh, my quads are working, they're burning. Yeah, it comes down to a few things. Number one, your capacity to recruit. If your capacity to recruit them is really, really good, quads are going to do a lot of work. If your capacity to recruit the other muscles is not that good, quads might be doing a lot of work. But knee extension is taking place as a consequence to hip extension. So what's happening here, if we look at the levers, we got the shin, we got the thigh, we got the torso. The muscles that pull on the 
thigh and the torso are producing force to bring those levers back to a more parallel position in relation with the direction of resistance. Knee extension happens by default. It's a consequence. It's not something that's actively happening. So hopefully that helps with your understanding of what's going on there. Rue Downs asked, do I have any experience with my reps? Now, the short answer is no. I don't have any experience by following that protocol. However, I will say this. The underlying principles to which myo reps are built upon do influence many of the decisions that I make. Now, for those who are unfamiliar, myo reps is just a way of managing what you do to perform more of what they call effective reps. Effective meaning maximum recruitment. Now, how can you maximize recruitment? Through lifting heavy, through lifting fast, or through fatigue. As you become fatigued, the weight is going to feel heavier than it actually is. So that's what myo reps does. It uses fatigue to maximize recruitment. It also incorporates the rest pause and incomplete rest to maximize recruitment and also train in an oxygen debt, depending on the intensity of the work that you're doing, there's an enhanced neural drive to doing that. So it's a very effective way to recruit and fatigue as many muscle fibers as possible without overworking your capacity to recover because it suggests not going to failure, not taking your set to failure. Remember, when you try to take a set to failure, you might inadvertently take the stress off the muscle that you're trying to stimulate and place it elsewhere to facilitate more reps to be performed. So the muscle you're actually trying to train could be doing less work while you're doing more reps. Is that going to benefit the muscle that you're actually trying to stimulate? Probably not, I mean maybe, but here's one thing that's for sure. It's going to add on to the amount of work that your body needs to recover from. So my reps a very effective way to go about building muscle, stimulating growth, but it's not something or a protocol that I've ever actually followed myself, even though the underlying principles do influence a lot of decisions that I make. Now, Free Animals had a comment in regards to the biceps and active insufficiency. He said, basically, can my intention overrule active insufficiency? So, active insufficiency, when a muscle is shortened at one joint, its capacity to produce force at the other joint is going to be limited. So, he said, based on that, wouldn't incline curls be the best way to train the biceps, for lack of a better term? I believe he said something along the lines of, incline equals more focus on the biceps. Now, you're confusing capacity to recruit with capacity to produce force. It's two completely different things. When the biceps are lengthened at the shoulder joint, their capacity to produce force at the elbow joint is going to be higher. When they're shortened at the shoulder joint, they enter active insufficiency. So you're saying you get a better peak contraction with your elbow in front of your body. Well, you should. The muscle's going into its shortest position. And as long as your capacity to recruit is where it needs to be, you're going to get a better peak contraction. This doesn't suggest that the peak contraction is going to be better on an incline. It's that the bicep's capacity to produce force is better. But also worth noting is we have to take into consideration your capacity to recruit. So it's two completely different things. So hopefully that helps with your understanding because I know in the comment it said something along the lines of you're going fucking crazy over this. You're not understanding it. Now, your capacity to recruit, if it's good, yeah, you're going to get a better peak contraction doing something a certain way. In fact, you know, I'm going to talk about this for a second. What you've done there is you've paid attention to the signs and signals and the feedback that your body has given you, and you've made the appropriate course correction as you go based on what you want to accomplish because you understand that training is a subjective experience that only you're experiencing. So you know what? I'm really fucking proud to hear someone doing that. They're making the right decision based on the right thing. So good for you for doing that. Now, you had a question in regards to peak contraction versus stretch reflex. I think I might not be understanding what you're asking. So if you do watch this, I'll just ask you to rephrase the question in the comments below so I can provide the appropriate feedback. But for now, peak contraction and stretch reflex are two things you can do at the exact same time. Peak contraction, you're just holding the contraction. Stretch reflex, you're rapidly lengthening the muscle to engage and activate the stretch reflex prior to contracting the muscle again. So you can go from peak contraction and then use the stretch reflex to contract the muscles and then hold the peak contraction again. So I'm not sure I fully understood what your question was. You just rephrase it and I'll do my best to answer. Until then, if you like the information, share it. Click the fucking button at the bottom of the screen you're looking at. Subscribe to the channel. Support me. And I'm going to keep on fucking bringing it.